Welcome everyone to SFG's latest live Zoomcast. Uh, today we are kicking off our Future Tech series with healthcare, and healthcare is a very large topic, so we have a lot of interesting things to talk about within that. Uh, future, uh, future Future Tech sessions will uh, run the gamut from other types of technologies, tech enabling, and other areas that we are looking at both from an investing viewpoint and for the viewpoint of the uh, health and well-being and progress of our clients, whether business or personal. So today, a couple of reminders. Uh, we do uh, want everyone who has a question, put it in the Q&A session. And that section, um, we will try to make sure that we get to as many of the questions as possible. Uh, we are joined today by Dax Dixon out of our Chapel Hill office and PJ Williams, our co-chief investment officer. And both of them have a considerable background in uh, the area we're talking about and have been studying it for a while. So I think it's going to be an entertaining discussion. And then we are joined by our special guest, Jay Goss with Wavemaker, who's going to uh, give us some some uh, cool examples of things going on in the world right as we speak. So let's get this kicked off. Uh, and the, the first um, interesting slide we have is around how innovation happens. And so this is from a book that we have talked about in the past in some of our chats called Loon Shots, L-O-O, L-O-O-N-S-H-O-T-S. -O -O and Loon Shots, fascinating stories. And we would recommend that to anyone uh, just as a good general read, uh, good summer read about a lot of the things that have happened in our country, the progress of those, and the types of people that have made it happen. And some of the stories will surprise you. Well, they talk about in that book, the concept of P-type innovation versus S-type innovation. Uh, Dex, walk us through, what does that mean? Uh, thank you, Dennis. This was, Moonshots was almost required reading uh, when I first started and early in my tenure at Stearns. PJ really stressed how valuable it was to think about uh, and, and the framework that, that Sophie McCall uses to talk about innovation within industries and sectors. And so within the framework of future tech, there's two types of innovations. The first type is P-type, which is a product type innovation. And oftentimes when you first hear of a P-type innovation, people say, there's no way there, that cannot work. Um, and so examples of P-type innovations are like vehicles. The first time they came out really revolutionized, revolutionized the way things move through the economy and how people move. So it introduces a new product or technology and it dramatically uh, disrupts existing businesses. Just think of you know, horseshoe makers when the automobile came around, right? And so, and P-type innovations often accelerate during stressful events. I think within the book, they talked about the world wars and how that led to explosive innovation. And certainly within the realm of healthcare, we've seen some early shoots of that because of the COVID pandemic has definitely accelerated some trends that we were seeing previously. Uh, in S-type innovation, on the other hand, is often, when you hear it, you say, there's no way that can't, that won't work. And that introduces a new strategy or business model. So you can think of, you know, an existing customer segment that is not really stressed uh, by incumbents, like people in rural areas. When retailers first started focusing on them, for example, uh, they disrupt existing business trends and it tends to be gradual. So it, even in hindsight, you're, it's difficult to spot what exactly changed within the industry. But then you look back and obviously there was some innovation um, on the strategy side that completely revolutionized the way you interface with certain businesses. Uh, so with that, I'll, I'll transition over to PJ to talk about precision medicine, which is very much in the, the P-type uh, side of the innovation equation. Thanks, Dax. And today we're really gonna focus on two areas of evolving, I'd say technology in the world of healthcare. We're gonna talk about precision medicine, and then we're gonna talk about digital health. You know, at a high level, when we're thinking about precision medicine, what you can see on this slide is, you know, we have a patient population of many different types of people. 
Well, right now for a certain type of disease, let's say cancer, Alzheimer's, whatever it might be, you know, we may only, may only have a few drugs for that specific cancer or for curing Alzheimer's. And we give that to everybody that we diagnose with that disease, um, regardless of their genetic makeup, regardless of their environment, regardless of their lifestyle. And, you know, for, for many, and, and we're getting better at it by the day, uh, they are cured from whatever uh, disease they have with this medicine that they have access to. But in a world and where we want to get to, we want to look at more than just giving you know, a medicine to the broad population. We want to look at sub segments of that population identified by their genomic makeup, by again, their lifestyle, the environment they live in and say for this group of people, we want to give treatment A or for this group treatment B. Um, in the past, it's, you, you may have also heard personalized medicine, precision medicine is kind of evolving. There's a lot of overlap between those two terms, but we, we really need to understand that medicine is not one size fits all. And that the goal for medicine longer term is to match the right drugs to the right people. And so if we go to the next slide, you know, what we're, this is, again, it's a, it's a dated study. It is from 2001. Um, things have gotten better in the world of healthcare since then. But it's, it's showing the idea that for a adult population, the drugs many times are ineffective. This is looking at different diseases and how effective drugs are or really how ineffective they are. So back in 2001, when this study was done, when you're looking at diabetes drugs, 43% of the population, it was ineffective. When you're looking at cancer, it was 75%. And so again, this is the need for, you know, the great R&D and great technology and, and, and drugs have come to market, but they don't work for everyone. And so if we can determine a better way to go about the R&D side and then the application to the correct patient population, it would hopefully be earlier um, diagnosis and, and treatments and also better outcomes for many patients. And so if we go to the next slide, what we're going to look at on this slide is really the ecosystem of precision medicine. So on the left, we're looking at, you know, who are the players and, and what is going on in this area of medicine? We obviously have patients, the providers, whether that be the nurses, the doctors taking care of the patients, payers, when we think about insurance companies, the pharma has obviously, you know, been a big player this past year as we've uh, developed the vaccine in, in a record amount of time, uh, medical technology, and we'll talk, touch on that later when Dax uh, discusses digital health, diagnostics, and, and again, just a broad uh, discussion of technology. But really when we're looking at the ecosystem and how it works together and how it flows, the beginning of it when we're thinking of precision medicine is really that top, uh, top box on the right. We're looking at omics, which is really omics, just think of it as aiming to uh, collect characterization and qu uh, quantification of different types of pools of biological molecules. The one that we are all most, many of us that are non-scientists are most familiar with, I would say is genomics. And we're gonna talk about that some more on the coming slides, but really gathering that data and then making sense of it. Um, we're looking at the impact of what this data may be able to provide to us. It is thinking about individualized therapies. And that is kind of a, another word maybe for precision medicine. When you're thinking about targeting people based on their personal characteristics with uh, different uh, concoctions of drugs. Um, we also believe that you know, if we get this amount of data and it's in a centralized spot, hopefully it will improve R&D models. And so that when, when pharma companies and biotech companies are, are doing research and trying to develop drugs, that they will have more data about what they are targeting and what they are attempting to treat, um, what might be more prevalent in the uh, patient population. And so hopefully maybe it's a more efficient pathway uh, to the market, hopefully at less cost, but with better outcomes uh, for patients. Yeah. And again, go ahead, Glenn. Oh, sorry, PJ. I was just going to mention that uh, PJ and I were on a briefing not too long ago with the CEO of Moderna, and you would think that most of the conversation was around their COVID development, which there was some of that and what they would do with variants coming up on COVID. But it was also about the hundred other drugs that they have in development and the fact that the research, this R&D that has happened the last 10 years has set the stage for some of the things you're gonna be hearing about. Um, so none of this is uh, you know, happening instantaneously. It's a result of a lot of foundational work that has happened in the past. Exactly. And we'll touch on this in, in a few slides, but when you think about the Human Genome Project starting in the early 90s, 
how far we've come. And, and we'll, we'll talk about that in the coming slides. But um, again, great strides have been made in the world of healthcare, um, and it's continuously improving every day. And, um, and also a reminder that for those of you who want to know more about the genomic side, we mentioned in our uh, intro piece the, the new book uh, by Walter Isaacson, Codebreaker. And uh, that book will give you a lot of really interesting, up-to-date information about what's happening in that area. Yeah, again, the, the author's written many great books so far, looking at the lives of people and their, their accomplishments and what that, that's meant for society. This one touches on Jennifer Dalda and really a lot of, a lot of focus on CRISPR technology that's been developed um, over, the, over the years. Um, on, on the middle box here, on the clinical decision support, this is really kind of intertwined with individualized therapies. It's really providing some data to the doctors who are making decisions about um, what to prescribe to their patients. And if they have a better idea of what their patient is in terms of genomic makeup and their lifestyle, and they have better data on, okay, well, in, if we look at history, what drug has done the best for this kind of group of, um, I'd say group of uh, characteristics of the patient, hopefully we can get to the right drug quicker. And, you know, right now, and, and historically, it's been a little bit more of what's available, what do we think might be the best, but if we can actually align the data to have evidence historically of what has worked the best, you can start there. And hopefully that's, again, lower cost for everybody, a quicker outcome for the patient, less testing for the patient. And so that, that's kind of evolving right now. But again, that's, again, that point we want to get to um, for better patient outcomes. And, and the bottom box is really interesting uh, with the biggest uh, item here, the monetized data in terms of thinking about what other companies are going to try to come into this space. Um, there's going to be so much data, whether it's the sequencing of genomes, uh, you know, the number of base pairs we're looking at, uh, looking at healthcare records. And again, um, and Dax will touch on some of this when we talk about digital health. Privacy is obviously a big concern and, and a, a, a hurdle that has to be overcome for the amount of data to be quality data that helps um, get to better decision and better outcomes. But the amount, amount of data in the healthcare space is something that you know, I don't think many people can comprehend. I learned a new term the other day doing, doing some research for this, and I'm, I might not pronounce it right, but a Yoda byte. You know, that is the amount of data when you think about uh, storage space needed for healthcare data alone that we're approaching. It might be next year, it might be a couple of years from now, but a Yoda byte is a trillion terabytes. A terabyte is a trillion bytes. Again, I'm not, not a tech guy, but that, that is a lot of uh, necessary storage space for just healthcare data. And we think about outside of that, social media data, astronomy data, everything else. It, it's a lot. Um, two other and, things in this. Go ahead, Dennis. Well, no, I was, I was just going to uh, ask you a question, PJ, uh, because there's a lot of discussion actually in the latest edition of MIT Technology Review, March, April edition, about the uh, growth of all this. I mean, first of all, there's a lot of discussion about all those entities on the left-hand side of this chart, how they don't always agree on the path ahead. That probably could be another couple hour discussion about the messiness between those entities on the left. But then the uh, digging down into this, the uh, whole privacy of information versus the more data you have available, the better outcomes you have. Uh, again, we were on a briefing recently with the, uh, the, one of the leading Mayo Clinic people in this area who talked about that. That's just a huge problem uh, that they are trying to overcome. Um, but it, it, it remains a difficult path forward for some of this. And so I was wondering uh, what your opinion might be on how some of those debates might play out. Well, I, I think it's absolutely going to be an issue um, when you think about uh, privacy, cybersecurity. I mean, it's it's every other week. It seems like you hear about a hospital system that's been, um, you know, hacked, and you know they're demanding some some type of ransom, whether it's uh, in the form of cash or some other means uh, to unlock the system. And, and and I think people are concerned that the more and more information you have on me, what does that mean for my privacy and you know, there's, there's lots of concern about that. And it's going to be a balance of convincing 
I think people that, you know, maybe having more data out there, uh, you know, an anonymous data, and again, convincing somebody that it can remain anonymous is the key part in all this. But the more anonymous data that we have out there, the better it is for the overall population in terms of getting to better outcomes uh, for patients. And so it, it, it's, it's something that's going to stay with us and it is going to be a barrier maybe to getting all the data that we want as quickly as we want or need to, to get the most out of this idea of precision medicine. Um, but again, it's, it's gonna be a balancing act um, and, and it's gonna be having to have doctors and scientists and convince the, 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 the public that this is, this is a, a positive for the world. And without that, again, you're, gonna, you're always gonna have reluctance, but if we can get more and more people going down this path and being willing to share their data because that, that data being shared might not help their generation, but now we have that data for the next generation, for the next person that's like you that gets that disease. Um, and maybe it's a quicker and better outcome. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, oh, and one of our audience just reminded me that uh, Google just this week got its hand slapped about uh, sharing of data that wasn't supposed to be shared. So <laughs> it, it is going to be an ongoing problem. Data can be monetized. Data is money to social media companies, to healthcare companies. They can utilize it. Well, it's also money to people that have nefarious um, uh, desires and, and goals and, and hackers that, that use that data for other means that it's not, not, not purpose for. So the two other things in the, in the bottom box there, um, we're thinking about really direct the patient. In some ways, and Dax may touch on this, get, providing patients with more access to their own data uh, right now, we have a very decentralized system um, of, of uh, patient uh, data records across, you know, depending on if you've moved or if you have different insurance, your, your data is spread out over a lot of different areas and not centralized. Um, and also value-based reimbursement. I mean, if we get to the point where we have a better idea on how to treat different diseases quickly and more efficiently and more cost-effective, maybe value-based reimbursement can become more of a, a mainstream idea. Right now, I think there's still lots of concerns about it. Uh, given you know how patients might act, how doctors might act, and what the where where the um, where the carrots are driving people in certain directions, um, but that value-based reimbursement is definitely something that's being being considered, and it would be a part of the idea of uh, a more advanced precision medicine system. Well, a lot to consider on this slide, and, and this is just touching more uh, on what we've been talking about when we're thinking about precision medicine, where we're at today you mostly hear about it um, as a means to cancer treatments. Um, again, we talked about that being able to map a person's genomes creates opportunities for better outcomes, not only for them, but again, for other patients, other parts of the human population. And it's for both two reasons, preventative care, so that you can early detection that maybe somebody with this gene uh, genomic makeup, with this lifestyle, living in this environment is more susceptible to a certain type of disease. Well, if you know that earlier, you can start treating it earlier, hopefully provide a, a better and less costly outcome. And then what we're really talking about in terms of where we're at today uh, more so is treatment and that drugs that are targeted to specific cancers and specific patients. Um, so again, patient A walks in and they, they are presented with, they're presenting these symptoms and you know their genomic makeup looks like this. Well, we've tried drug Y on a very similar person to person A and it worked very quickly. Well, let's start with drug Y. Maybe that's not the most popular drug and hasn't had the best success rate, but it worked for this type of person with this makeup. And then that's the key here. So on the next slide, if we're talking about, again, the cost, the amount of things that are going on when we're looking at chronic illnesses. And again, many people in America have a chronic illness. You know, this, 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 this um, data on this chart is showing that nearly 60% of Americans suffer from at least one chronic illness. Uh, almost 24% of Americans will be over age 65 by 2050 and nearly all will have a chronic illness in that patient population. And that's expensive. Nearly 87% of prescriptions filed or fill, filled are for the treatments of chronic illness. So it's a lot of people, 172 million. It, it affects, it's across many different diseases, whether it's Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and it's expensive. Um, again, 2.7 trillion represents 86% of total annual healthcare related expenditures. So a lot of people experience chronic illnesses, it's very expensive to treat. So this is talking about molecular medicine might enable early disease detection. Again, precision medicine is focused on that. It's focused on ideal, uh, identifying 
uh, genomic makeups and consistencies and similarities and utilizing molecular medicine to earlier um, treat these patients and hopefully reduce the burden of the disease and get a, again, we, we, I keep saying the same thing over and over, a quicker and less costly effective outcome for the patient. So on the next slide, we're, this is just an astounding chart when you're thinking about progress we've made. Um, we talked about, uh, I mentioned earlier, the Human Genome Project. Started in the, the early 90s, lasted until I believe 2003, billions of dollars, a couple billion dollars were spent on it. So it took a long time to map the, the human genome. Um, this is looking at the cost uh, per genome um, that we're looking at today. And you know, when you think of a genome, that really is what the, the DNA within a cell's nucleus. Um, when you think back to high school uh, biology, you learned about uh, the different bases, whether it's GA, TC, how they could connect. Again, not a, don't have a science background, so I'm not going to go too deep into that. But the mapping of the genome, you're looking at on this chart back in the early 2000s, 100 plus million dollars, and it could take one, two, three, four years to map a genome. Um, that line that's showing the decline there, Moore's Law. Moore's Law is something that you more think of with computing power. It's the idea that computing power is, computing power is doubling every two years. And so here it's showing that healthcare progress in terms of bringing down the cost um, of sequencing or the cost of sequencing a genome has declined much quicker than even Moore's law would allow for. And we're now gone from hundreds of millions per genome to about a thousand dollars per genome. And it could be done, done within a day or two. Um, so just astounding um, decline in both cost and speed. And so with that, it's cheaper for us to get more and more data it's going to also allow us to, um, again, ramp up the data set very quickly. But again, to Dennis's point, you can only go so far uh, because of the concerns about privacy. And on the, on the next slide, what we talk about is really looking at how much data is out there. And we're looking at just, this is looking at the volume of publicly shared, shared genomic data. And so again, bases, going back to thinking about the different pairs within DNA, but we've gone from you know, having very little to having you know, trillions uh, right now. But again, even with trillions, we need a lot more um, in terms of getting characteristics of the genomic makeup of, again, lifestyle, environment somebody lives in uh, to really make precision medicine more mainstream and more uh, useful across a broader range of diseases. Again, cancer's kind of been a focus, focal point so far, but there's many other areas within medicine where precision medicine can be applied um, hopefully for better uh, patient outcomes. Yeah, and uh, we'll mention that on that previous slide about the cancer treatments that some of the experts in that area believe that we're going to be getting well below $250 as a cost for mapping each of our uh, genetic makeups and that uh, particularly where there are anomalies in that genetic issue that may be specific to uh, us having a higher chance of a certain disease, that uh, that is just going to be an explosive area in the next five to 10 years. Um, I mean, it's already exploding as we speak, but it's um, uh, the folks at Mayo and other places believe that it, this is going to be one of the mega, mega trends within the bigger super trend of uh, technology accelerators. All right. So now we get to digital health. Dax, tell us what that's all about. Yeah, thank you, Dennis. I, I do believe this is one of the areas that we've seen growth and adoption over the past few years, but certainly during the past year when everybody wanted to stay at home and, and may have had some hesitancy to, to go into a physical location to see their provider. And I, I believe that at, the, at its very core, digital health is leveraging digital mediums to improve patient outcomes uh, through better information, better monitoring, better diagnostics, and, and better, better preventative care outside of maybe traditional healthcare settings. And I think one of the keys is also better access. So if you live in a rural community, you could still get to see world-class doctors through televisits, for example. Um, so on the next slide, we'll, we'll kind of visit some of the ecosystem around digital health. It goes everything from remote monitoring, which has been very big for clinical trials and will continue to accelerate into the future. Into the future, wearables actually saw something today 
in preparation for this where they're developing um, a temporary tattoo that you can do remote monitoring through for things like strokes and certain types of heart diseases, things like that. And at the center, I think that you and, and PJ touched on this is cybersecurity. And so how can you protect patient data, but also have better data for, for clinicians to make better decisions um, and help patients get to better outcomes? I think that's going to continue to be extremely important, um, at, whether it's from the, the legal side as well as from the technical side of protecting that data. And so on the next slide, we'll just talk a little bit about you know, why these advancements are necessary. So, so far, um, the US life expectancy is lower than other countries. And that's because we have high cost patients uh, within our healthcare system. So better access uh, will hopefully drive some of those costs down because in the future, what we're gonna see is actually a physician shortage here in the US, um, which will lead to more errors and things like that. And so I think over the long term access to healthcare and, and better monitoring will continue to drop some of those cost downs and increase life expectancy um, by using some of these, these digital health tools. Yeah, and I know this is a big topic of discussion right now. Some of the pandemic uh, relaxations of uh, different areas, the, the payments within the Medicare system for telehealth, and again, an area of a lot of debate right now between certain parts of physician communities and others and uh, the people who uh, are trying to democratize this out to a broader audience. So uh, stay tuned. I'm sure there'll be a lot more of those articles you can read in the very near future. All right, well, so we have kind of set the stage here for, you know, where do we go next? And uh, on the investing side, before I turn it over to Jay to talk to, about some of the uh, cool stuff that's uh, going on, uh, on the investing side, you know, there are both public and private opportunities to invest. Uh, one of the things we would remind our clients is that companies that you might never guess are in this space are actually in this space. And so there are a number of public companies already in your portfolios who are doing elements of the things that Dax and PJ talked about. Now, it is uh, within the broad construct of a bigger company, whether that's, uh, so it's a bit diluted in terms of the benefit of this. The direct investing areas that we have explored Many of those, because of the pandemic frenzy, are in what we would describe as a frenzy to the third power at this point from a valuation viewpoint. But this is one of the huge, huge trends of the next decade, not just for all of our personal health, which is a pretty good thing, but also from an investing viewpoint. So. Uh, the fact that these have bid, been bid up, the question really is, uh, you know, how overvalued are some of them or will they grow into their valuation? Well, we had those same questions back in the 90s when the biotech revolution really started. And uh, again, Jay uh, down in Southern California uh, knows very well uh, that revolution actually uh, largely started in Southern California, a few other places, but Southern California had a lot of it. And there were survivors who today are big companies that we all know of, uh, but there were a lot of casualties as well. Well, let's go back to the four stages of a techno um, pattern for a trend that we've talked about many times on chats. First stage is frenzy, where it's exciting, a lot of great things are happening, but then there's a consolidation period. Consolidation period could also be called a bust for some of the players who are not gonna be the survivors. Then you get into the deployment stage. The deployment stage is where all that stuff that happened back in the frenzy stage is actually getting traction. Well, we've talked about in many of our chats, uh, including some of our written trends newsletters, 
we're in one of the most powerful deployment stages uh, actually in most of our lifetimes. And the same thing is true in this healthcare area. So again, are they richly valued? Some of these public companies, yes. Um, will they potentially grow into the future? Yes, but we definitely consider this in our core and explorer methodology to be more in the explore area. And again, a reminder that some of this you already have exposure to in your core area of your portfolio. Uh, we also have a number of private options and those private options uh, all have interesting characteristics. But again, uh, as we've mentioned in recent newsletters, some of them are only available to accredited investors. Some of them are available only to qualified investors. But to the extent that you meet those qualifications, that's a broader discussion. They're still in the explore area. Um, so uh, none of this I would put in the core area at this point. But um, you know that creates some interesting opportunities for those folks who qualify for some of the private options. Now, speaking of a private option, um, we have uh, Jay Goss, one of the partners with WaveMaker. And so Jay, tell us just you know, the things that you're hearing and seeing daily, what are some of the cool things going on? What other things kind of tie into this discussion that uh, Dax and PJ had about some of the emerging trends? Well, thanks, Dennis. I'll, I'll do my best. And good morning or afternoon to everybody. Um, it's great to be here. As I was, as I was listening to the, the parts that Dax and PJ were sharing, I think one of the, I was, thinking about precision medicine, I was thinking about digital health. One of the things that we're spending a lot of time that almost neatly puts a bow around both of the two concepts that we heard a lot of good information about today is this concept of hospital at home. And we touched on a lot of reasons. You're gonna to start to hear that buzzword a lot more. We've heard it, we, it started to become a thing during the pandemic for different reasons because we weren't allowed into the hospital. But this, this paradigm of hospital at home is necessary, which I'll go into a little bit, but being enabled by things like precision medicine and certainly digital health. Um, but Dax talked a little, just a, just a sliver there about the, the population situation, but we're, we're, we're graduating or, or becoming seniors at a, at a very big rate right now. About 11,000 of us will turn 65 today and 11,000 turn 65 tomorrow and, and on and on and on, um, which means we have a bigger percentage of the population consuming more healthcare services. We can't build hospitals fast enough. We can't, we can't brick and mortar our way out of the population situation in the United States. But it's a, it's a double whammy. And we, we've, been, we've been hearing about and thinking about the baby boomers retiring, the baby boomers retiring. That, that's been, that, that's a, a dead horse at this point. We've been hearing about that forever. But what people lose sight of a little bit is every time 11,000 people turn 65, about 1,100 people retire out of the healthcare industry, the nurses, the doctors, and the other allied healthcare professionals. So at the very time that the United States needs a, a bigger capability around health, healthcare is a time that we're, our service providers, the human beings that do the good work to keep us healthy and get us out of disease states, that pool is becoming smaller. So that's where precision medicine offers a chance for us to be more efficient. If you wanna just think about it as the efficiency of medicine, and that's certainly where digital health can jump in to say, we're gonna to have to find some other business models for lack of a better term to take care of our population because the hospital can't be at the epicenter anymore. We don't have enough of them to serve the population today. We don't have enough, certainly don't have enough hospitals to serve the population 20 years from now. And the people in those hospitals are, is a, is a, as a resource is becoming limited relative to the, the overall size of the United States population and especially our seniors. So it's putting pressure on the system in both directions. Um, the good news, I mean, that, that would all have been very alarming in the 50s and 60s and 70s because we wouldn't have had much technology to get ourselves out of the predicament. The good news is we have, we have genomics and omics in general. I mean, we, we spent a lot of time in this conversation talking about the popular 
omics, which is genomics, but there is proteomics around proteins. There is metabolomics around metabolites and how your metabolism works. Dennis's metabolism works differently than my metabolism. And that may have more to do with the efficacy of a particular therapy than our genes, or it at least needs to be part of the conversation. So there's a lot of elements to omics and because of data, they're going to start to come together. And then we also spend a lot of time talking about, it's almost this tension around data. On the other hand, we, on one hand, we want to let data move around freely. On the other hand, this is very valuable and the United States believes should be protected data when it comes to our health information. Um, I think the, the, some of the neat things that are going on right now are technology companies that are coming onto the scene. They're, they're under the radar screen for most of us right now, but they're coming onto the scene to solve the problem of how can we encrypt these data sets much better than we've ever been able to do in such a way that the owners of the data set can freely share them with the owners of, let's say, algorithms. And the two can come together so that the guy that owns the algorithm doesn't have to worry about it being stolen. And the person or entity that owns the data doesn't have to worry about it being stolen and the two can work together. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of technology that's coming out of the scene almost literally this year, but certainly in the last few years, that's going to, that's going to also accelerate this concept around precision medicine, because the, the, if, if we could feel more confident about how we're securing data sets and the algorithms that run against those data sets, then we can advance our healthcare, our medicine, our science a lot faster because we'll be freer to move things around. So that's another, that's another accelerant to what's going on here. Well, so Jay, I've got a question for you. Um, in terms of the types of things that you're involved with right now, uh, how many of those are more general population versus the aging senior population? Um, that's an interesting way to, so, so our portfolio has 40 of these groundbreaking company and groundbreaking technologies in it. Um, probably more than two thirds are either focused on aging or the aging population, let's call it seniors, is a big part of their business model. Um, if, you're in the, if you're in the space of, we talked about chronic care, um, if you're in the space of chronic care or polychronic where you have, where you have multiple chronic conditions, are you, is that a senior care business or is that not? It's not to say you couldn't be polychronic and be 32, but you're more likely to be polychronic if you're 72. Um, so probably two thirds to three fourths of our companies either entirely focus on seniors or focus on seniors a lot, just because that's where that medical condition or um, even if it's an ailment or a wellness issue, tends to kick in. Okay. Well, um, so uh, some of our audience wants to know uh, what some of those things might be that, that um, could be beneficial to their personal health in the future. Uh, another question here, and I don't know how you can answer this exactly, but I know you hang around a lot of people in the healthcare industry and you have a former deputy director of the FDA who's on your team and you have um, people who run some of the largest healthcare entities in the country that are part of your advisory board and board and everything else. So I'm sure you hear a lot <laughs> of things. And the question is uh, from one of our clients who is in the physician space, and so uh, they were two younger uh, physicians married to each other, uh, one a radiologist, one a dermatologist. And the radiologist already saw the handwriting on the wall in terms of future changes and wanted us to change some of our uh, projections for the future in their 
roadmap planning, uh, but he thought his wife might be bulletproof on the dermatology side. Uh, but then he changed his mind and they came back and said, no, we're not completely sure of that. So there's this big debate about, you know, is all the stuff you're talking about, uh, uh, Dax talked about the shortage of doctors, you know, is, is the doctor going to go the way of the uh, godo bird in this future that you're talking about? So, um, you know, it, it, you can either start with that one or you can start with the uh, cool things in your portfolio. Probably go hand in hand, Dennis. Um, the doctor is not going away. Uh, the nurse isn't going away. I would, I would say if there's a common denominator of the 40 companies in our portfolio, and then for 40 companies in our portfolio, there's another few thousand early stage health technology companies that we look at that are very interesting, very compelling. In a world of infinite resources, I'd invest in all of them because the world would be a better place if they were all funded companies. We just have to pick our, pick our spots very carefully. So it's, it's true, we see a lot, almost everything that's coming out of the healthcare industry minus we are not, as you know, a biopharma fund. So we're not, we're not too focused on drug discovery, but everything else we're very focused on. Um, the two things go together because what's coming out are technologies that make doctors better. It is the, is the simplest English to use to describe what these technologies do. And since you described a radiologist and a dermatologist, I'll zero in on something that I think we can all relate to, which is um, computer vision. It's without, without even knowing how the, these new technologies work, most of us, and if we can picture the last time we visited a dermatologist or the last time we had an x-ray or a CT or an MRI or an ultrasound, most of us would not put up too much of a fight, including the professionals in those fields, to agree that probably computers can read images and videos better than humans. If you, if you swallow a pill that takes a 22 hour journey through your body and that pill has a camera and somebody's gonna have to sit there and watch 22 hours of video to, to see what's going on in your body, it's not too hard to imagine that a computer can, in about a split second, can watch the two, 22 hours of video and maybe mark it up so that then the human being can come in and say, okay, at timestamp 13 hours and 37 minutes, let's pay attention to the polyp that we think the computer thinks it detected. And then at the 19 hour and 22nd minute, mark it there and have a clinician read the video there. So instead of somebody sitting there with their hand on their chin watching a 22 hour video, which must not be a very enjoyable job, the machine watches a 22 hour video in a second and tells the doctor where to look to make the final judgment call. We aren't good at detecting things with x-rays. The human eyes aren't good at detecting things related to x-rays and CT and MRI and ultrasound, um, but machines can be close to perfect and we're getting closer and closer to perfect. So it allows that radiologist or whoever is gonna hold the film up, up to the light and say, okay, the machine thinks I should look here, here and here, let me zero in on that so as to not miss anything. That's just, a, that's just one easy example of we still need the doctor to make the final call, but the machine can point the doctor in the right direction. And we've all been in that situation. We're looking at that, we're looking at that x-ray where, especially in the day when they would hold it up to the light and we kind of tilt our head sideways saying, I, I don't really see what you see, doctor. <laughs> the machine's gonna see it. Well, uh, interesting point, Jay. Um... I remember being in a meeting with one of the leading cancer researchers at a major university who talked about the explosion of uh, the clinical trials and the things going on around the world and how in the past he would have graduate students go through and read all these extensive uh, reports and the amount of data coming through, he said, I'd have to have you know, 10 times the number of graduate students. And oh, by the way, their eyes would frost over and they drop dead on their desk <laughs> after a certain amount of time doing some of this. So, um, and by yeah. the way, you're right. Because if, if you and I read everything up to Thursday, 
Today, when we woke up, we'd be 7,000 publications behind. That's, oh how, that's how fast, <laughs> that, that's assuming we could get through everything. So every day, there's 7,000 more research papers in the healthcare, medical, and scientific community that we would have to get caught up on across the world. No one can keep up with it. So again, another place for the machines to help us um, prioritize and make the inge ingestion of that information more plausible. Uh, very interesting and, and amazing and everything else all at the same time. So uh, talk to us a little bit about things that would just be uh, practical. I mean, they can have a G whiz attribute to them, but practical things that you're seeing. And again, it doesn't have to be in your portfolio if it's you know, something else in your travels that you've seen that you think will benefit us from a health viewpoint in the near future? Well, I think that one of the big categories that's gotten a ton of funding from a variety of different venture sources is this concept of remote patient monitoring and wearables, you know, whether it's your Apple Watch or the more sophisticated, you know, fancy specific devices that are more medical grade, and it goes back to hospital at home. We've got, you know, millions of Americans now that are wearing something on their, usually on their body. Sometimes it's built into their bed. Sometimes it's built into their toilet, um, you know, different, different gizmos for different purposes. But those gizmos are collecting data on us. And that data is, in principle, being sent to the clinician so that they can keep their eyes on us when we're not in their physical setting when we're not in their care, when we're not in the four walls of their hospital or four walls of their clinic. So remote patient monitoring is it's very exciting because we're able to monitor more. We, you know, we, we knew about it with uh, like continuous glucose monitoring. That was kind of the rage three, four or five years ago, but we now have the equivalent of continuous glucose monitoring for all kinds of different monitoring. Um, we have, we have a company that we're excited about that, that does this for kids, kids with asthma, kids with anxiety, kids with autism, kids that have different medical conditions. You put a, a cute little bracelet on the kid, and now mom and dad have peace of mind that we're monitoring that kid throughout their day when they're three years old to 10 years old, but that data is also going to the pediatrician or the children's hospital, whoever is sort of responsible for the care of that kid. Um, I think you could talk about, to, to try to tie it back into a, a, big, a big part of PJ's conversation around genomics. And we were, we were looking at the curves that were going down, um, the, the computing cost and the cost per genome. There's a little, there, there, there's one more curve that I'm looking for on that graph. And I'll, and I'll point it out, which is, there's the cost of the machine, the CRISPR machine, or whatever technology is being used to process the genome information. And think of it as a printout comes out. Well, there's a precious few number of human beings on the planet that can interpret that data. They're called bioinformaticians. So the other cost associated with that is how do we as a, as a planet Earth get more people able to interpret the data that's coming out of the genomics machines. Because it's one thing that we're bringing the, machine, the, the cost to process the genome down, but then somebody has to hold the printout and you know, look left and look right and, and interpret that information on behalf of either a population or a drug company or the individual patient. We do not have enough bioinformaticians on the planet Earth to be able to keep up with it. That's the real bottleneck. Technologies that can take that information and simplify it, not so that PJ and J can interpret it, but we do have a much larger group of what we would call biologists and bench scientists. If we could get the information in their hands in a form that they can interpret it, now we go from a few thousand bioinformaticians on the planet to tens of thousands of bench scientists on the planet. And then that bottleneck breaks up nicely and things can move even faster. So. Um, even even thinking about the ability to interpret the data that's getting that's coming out of these genomics analysis is an important consideration in all of this. Um, happens to be a place that we've spent some time and done some investing. 
Well, so uh, one of our audience members uh, says they're going to send this uh, recording to their grandchildren because they've already uh, noted seven new careers that didn't even exist in the past yeah, that are yeah. <laughs> being developed. And, and I'm guessing there's probably 70 or, you know, who knows how many. Yeah, there are a lot of interesting, a lot of interesting careers as healthcare become healthcare will become more precise. Um, the way the way the way clinicians spend their time will change over time. The 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 computer vision is an example, and then there's lots of technologies that are just um, we we the other view that we have. And, and I think it's appropriate to spend most of our time talking about technologies that improve the health outcome of the patient. That should be at the top of any pyramid. And then maybe one rung below that are things that improve the experience of the patient, not necessarily the health outcome, but is the overall experience better? Is it, is it a more convenient experience? Um, and of course, we have to talk about costs because if we can take some of the costs out of the U.S. healthcare system, that's good for the U.S., that's good for the world. But one of the places that we sometimes overlook is we also have to make this all better for the clinicians. This isn't going to, all of these new technologies aren't going to work out the way we want them to if we end up burning out the nurses and the doctors and all of the allied healthcare professionals who are now having to do more digital stuff than they ever wanted to. You know, the, the, you've heard the phrase before, no, no doctor ever went, ever went to medical school in order to spend two thirds of their time writing medical notes at the end of every one of their shifts. And yet that's what they're spending a lot of their time doing right now. That's not, that's not, the, that's not the, the goal for any doctor is to say, oh goody, I get to see patients from, you know, 8 to 4 p.m. And then I get to spend from 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. writing my medical notes. That's on its way. I mean, that, that there's, there's technologies that we're looking at very carefully that, that can listen in. If you want to think about uh, really interesting tension around data and data privacy, but technologies that can listen in. And as soon as I say the word, it's going to go off, but Alexa-like. So now my Alexa is going off, but it can listen into the natural conversation Think about that, the natural conversation that the doctor is having with the patient. And you might spend the first couple of minutes talking about your kid's soccer game yesterday. That doesn't need to go into the medical note. But if the machine could listen in on that conversation, a lot of good information comes out of the two or three or four or five or six minutes of conversation between the doctor and the patient. If a machine could listen into that and translate that into a medical grade note that is good for the patient, good for the care setting and also good for the insurance company. And a note doesn't have to be created by the doctor or a scribe, which just chews up manual time. That's going to make life much better for the clinician. So we're also looking at digital health solutions that are to the benefit of the providers of our healthcare system. Uh, very key thing, because we hear on a regular basis from those people um, that many of them are uh, stressed out <laughs> to yes. a very high degree. Yep. Yeah. Uh, okay, so we have a question. Again, I don't know if this one's in your um, wheelhouse or not, but uh, technologies in the mental health area concerning depression or anxiety. I'm very happy to report that mental health has finally gotten the attention of the venture community. Um, it is such a big part of so many diseases. It's, 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 and we know it now. We have so much more data. So don't want to quite go so far as to say mental health has become the little darling of the Silicon Valley and that all the dollars in healthcare investing are going to mental health. But mental health is finally starting to get its fair share of venture capital dollars. We've made some, we've made some bets in the mental health space. Um, what I'm most excited about is when we can start to find some technology that scales mental health. There's some technologies, come, there's some people out there that are developing video games that, because right now mental health is not very scalable. We can do a better job matching the patient to the mental health professional, the therapist, but that doesn't scale. We don't have enough mental health 
we have far, far too few mental health professionals in this country to take care of the mental health problem the way we traditionally have. But are there other digital therapeutics? Could you play? Could you imagine playing a video game or having a virtual reality experience that can be scaled to where that provides you some relief from the mental health condition that you have? Could you get your um, OCD under control? Could you could you um, dampen some of these other mental health issues with? some various forms of digital, probably still supplemented or complemented by the traditional patient therapist session. But some of the work is being done in a digital format with a digital therapy. We're very much interested in trying to find some of that. And we've looked at technologies that are video game-like. We've looked at technologies that are virtual reality-like. Um, and there's some very promising things coming out. And what's beautiful about that is that then can scale. We then can, we then can point that at a population of you know, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands and provide, provide some relief to them without it having to be one 45 minute session at a time. Very nice. Well, uh, so I know you're also involved with some of the uh, big uh, pitch events that happen where, where different entrepreneurs get up and pitch their concept, some of them uh, fully baked and some of them half baked. <laughs> um, have you heard any pitches lately that you said that, so back to the loon shot piece at the very beginning of this, you, you said, that's a great idea if it could work. <laughs> well, that's, you just described my job. I mean, what, what, what my team and what my team and I do, whether it's at a pitch event or individual pitches that we get every single day is we're, we're constantly being blown away with the new things that are coming out. Um, either, either business model driven or technology advanced driven, um, Physical therapy at home is an interesting example. Um, most big hospitals and health systems and medical acad and academic medical centers don't consider physical therapy to be core. Most of us, if we had the choice to go get in our car and go to the clinic to do our 45 to 60 minutes of physical therapy after a knee surgery, for example, or the physical therapist comes to our home or office and gives us the same 45 minute session there would choose the latter. That can happen now. We can route physical therapists around an urban population, around a city much better thanks to the Uber technologies of the world. And we can start bringing some of that stuff to you. We can, and, and what that does is increase compliance. So I, Dennis or, Let's, let's pick on Dax this time. Dax has a knee surgery. He gets prescribed 12 sessions of physical therapy. Statistically, Dax is going to do three and a half. He's going to leave eight and a half sessions on the table. He's not going to go to all the physical therapy sessions that he was prescribed because it becomes inconvenient. He's like, oh, I can just do my exercise at home. If that physical therapist would come to you. You do all 12. You would utilize that benefit fully, which is to the benefit of your knee and to your future health. So kind of tight. So it's, it's revolutionary in that we, I guess we could have always had our physical therapist coming to us, but by doing so, we now know we can do it efficiently because we can route that physical therapist through the city efficiently. So they're not spending a lot of time zigzagging around. And Dax is gonna do 12 sessions of physical therapy instead of three and a half. And his knee is gonna be better tomorrow and it's gonna be better 30 years from tomorrow. Um, and that's not even terribly revolutionary, by the way. There's nothing, there's nothing we couldn't have done if we were so organized 20 years ago. But so much of healthcare around surgeries boils down to what you do after the surgery. And if we as a country could do better with physical therapy, if we would be more compliant with what we're expected to do after our surgeries, we would recover from those surgeries better. There would be fewer readmissions. There would be fewer redos of the surgery, all of which contribute to the cost of the US healthcare system. And, and interestingly enough, we have a client in Raleigh, North Carolina, 
who went through knee surgery <clears throat> and is doing exactly what you just talked about. Um, so they have physical the screen, therapy at home. Yeah, screen in yeah. the living room, and right. and she loves it. She right. <laughs> she said, "Where was this twenty years ago?" Which, back to your point. Um, That's exactly right. That's yeah. Exactly right. Yeah. Okay, we're we're getting to the uh, top of the hour here, and uh, I'm sure there's a, a lot of other questions that may be out there. It's not often that we that our audience gets to pick the brain of a, uh, a venture capitalist like you that are right smack dab in the middle of so many interesting things. What would you like to leave us with in terms of the of the trends and some of the ways that all this is going? You know, what I want to leave leave us with, and it was at the bottom of one of the slides, it was about the fourth slide, I think, that PJ had up. One of the things that is really great about everything that we've talked about today is, it was, I think it was three words on slide four, it was around value-based health and value-based outcomes. What I would leave you with is the notion that the next time you go to the pharmacy to get an over-the-counter bottle of pills to, to deal with a headache, imagine the scenario where you're paying the pharmaceutical company who manufactured those pills based on the results of taking that pill. So if I have a headache and you have a headache tonight, Dennis, and, and your pill bottle takes care of your headache in 15 minutes, you pay more than if I take the same pill and that pill doesn't take care of my headache in 15 minutes. You, uh, the, the, the country is moving in the direction of paying for outcome, not just paying for the service. And that puts the pressure in a very healthy way around incentivizing the outcome that we want. That could be true with surgeries, that could be true with mental health, that could be true with the headache and the bottle of Advil versus the bottle of Tylenol. Um, value-based health and value-based outcomes is an exciting kind of economic pressure that's gonna make a lot of this stuff stick because we, we've committed to it as a country. And um, it's a whole other topic, I realize, but if I was gonna try to put one little final thought around this, it's what's going on at the macroeconomic level that's stimulating some of these changes and rewarding the participants, the constituents of the US healthcare system to do, do good around outcomes, not do good around simple-minded simple fee-for-service healthcare. Well, uh, that is a radical way to end this <laughs> program, but we will, we will definitely check back in with you, Jay, periodically and, and get what else is going on uh, uh, around the world. And again, thanks to uh, Dax and PJ for uh, leading us through a very large area and giving us some things to think about, as well as Jay, thank you. Reminder that this session has been recorded, will be on our Stearns Financial YouTube channel uh, within a, a day or two, and uh, we encourage you to send us your questions. Uh, we have already a lot of ideas from our audience uh, and our clients about what kind of future tech you want to hear about, whether it's things that more directly influence you or that are more actionable from an investment viewpoint or both. Uh, keep those cards and letters coming. Hope you all remain safe. Have a wonderful weekend. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.